It's my very great honor tonight uh, to bring you this speaker. Before I get into that, I just wanted to give some thanks. Um, I'd like to thank the Port Workspaces for hosting us three months in a row here. Um, they just let us have this space to do what we want with, which is awesome. Um, they also helped us with the videographer tonight at the last minute, so thank you to Steve for that. And uh, lastly, thanks to Clef back there, guys. We have Jesse, uh, Brennan, and Mark. Um, and not you. <laughs> um, but they are, they're providing the, the food and drinks tonight, so thank you to them. Um, we'll hear a little, bit about, uh, uh, a little bit about them later in the program. But, in the program. Um, but um, we'll kick off with Ian, um, AKA Angelot. Uh, so Ian, um, Ian plays a very special role in my life. So when I was starting off as a D3 kind of freelancer, um, I was broke, right? And so Ian, Ian held the, uh, the D3 Unicon. I think a lot of you went to that in March. And I couldn't afford it, so I emailed him. I'm like, hey, I'd love to come, but I can't afford it. And he hooked me up, like he, he let me be a volunteer. And he's been kind, and, and he let me organize this stuff. So Ian has been very kind and gracious to me, and so it's a very great honor um, to present you here tonight, Ian. Thank you for bringing your dream. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming and listening to me talk about uh, data rules, everything around me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave this presentation not in presentation mode because I'm going to switch between tabs and stuff. I don't want to make it very jarring. But uh, yeah, so my name's Ian. I think I'm more known as Angelot at this point. And I consider myself a data alchemist. I'll talk a little bit about why I say that uh, later in the presentation. And I work at a company called Lever, um, where I've been working for the last two years. So a good part of this talk will be about how I'm thinking about data at Lever as well. So just a little bit of history. Three years ago, I moved to the Bay Area from Florida. Uh, I joined a company, and they asked me from right from the start to just start learning D3 and do it full time. I think it was a very fortunate opportunity. And you know, I, I was D3 has a very difficult learning curve, as all of you should know. Uh, so I was just fortunate to bang my head against the desk every day instead of every just every evening maybe. Um, and I spent a lot of time on the D3 mailing list. And a few months after, you know, banging my head all the time, I noticed that there were several other people in the area who were also doing the same thing and thought maybe we could get together and maybe, you know, find uh, commiserators to commiserate with. Uh, the first meetup in February of 2012 had uh, six people show up, I think. I think maybe a couple more showed up. And Mike Bostock actually showed up unannounced. Um, there's a funny story about that Eric has, <laughs> if you want to ask him later. Um, you know, not, not too much, uh, I think maybe a year later, we hit uh, 1024 members. And we, a few of us made a, an interactive graphic to celebrate that. You can see uh, all the, the members joining here. This is, you know, each day is, is a row, and then the, the events. And it goes on like this um, for quite a while. Now we're at something like 26, almost 2,700 members. Um, and you know, it's a lot of people that want to learn D3 and, and do it together. So you know, along, along the way, you know, outside of our day jobs, we realized you know, we had this community growing. And a lot of people that want to practice their skills, sharpen their knowledge. Um, and, and you know, with more people wanting to do that, we figured, you know, how can we maybe like make a con collective impact? So we started organizing some events in between the talks and in between the, the lectures where we would, you know, ask people to bring their data or bring some data, you know, maybe work on it together, find other people to do it. We held events in, you know, the Civic Center Library in downtown San Francisco. Um, or maybe at some other uh, place. I think Rackspace hosted us for a sort of undirected hack day that a lot of people liked. But we realized that you know, maybe if we provided some open data for people to rally around, we could you know, maybe make some kind of impact uh, while letting people have fun on their off days and, and learn something. So we did several, 
several different events. We did an urban data challenge with, with Swissnex where they brought together data from uh, San Francisco and Zurich and Geneva. And we held a hackathon for that. Again, with Swissnex, we hosted an earthquake-related data set, an earthquake preparedness here in San Francisco, uh, where we, we got all kinds of public data and simulations about how earthquakes might affect the Bay or have in the past. Um, we, we organized campaign finance hackathon with Code for America, you know, bringing D3 expertise and visualization expertise to the you know, public uh, policy area. And also, I think one of our, our biggest events was the, the BART hackathon that we put together. This actually ended up being two or three days. The first, the first event wasn't enough, uh, but it, it's one of my, my favorite things still, like all the different visualizations that came out of it, the people that met each other, and the impact that we had. We got to present this data at a couple different events, and, and we got it in front of some of the BART board of directors who have since given us more data to play with. Mm -hmm. So if anybody, actually we just recently got this like a month ago. Um, I think I have an example here. Um, all the entry <coughs> exit data for the month of October 2012, which is the highest ridership because of the um, World Series victory on uh, October 31st that year. So if anyone wants to play with that, you know, we're, uh, we have it and we, we can organize another event like this. So I think, you know, these, these kind of things have been some of my favorite uh, outcomes of being involved with this community. And, you know, I'm hoping to do a lot more. Uh, along the way, myself and some friends developed a project called Tributary, which was inspired by the, the Brett Victor Inventing on Principle uh, talk. Has anyone seen that? Not enough of you have, so uh, the link is somewhere here on the page. It's really a game-changing talk about how we should think about visualization and uh, computing in general. And you know, out of that came, came Tributary, which is sort of an in-browser development environment where here is an example. I have some, some code on the right-hand side. There's SVG provided to you and D3 provided to you on the left-hand side, kind of like CodePen or one of those JS Fiddle, but specifically for D3. Um, you know, the idea being that when we started this, we wanted to be able to quickly understand SVG or D3 APIs. There's a lot of them out there. There's, you know, all kinds of things to learn. So practice makes perfect. If you can really quickly and effortlessly uh, practice, then, you know, you get better faster. It's also been sort of a prototyping environment where you know, like this, I was prototyping, trying to, to come up with, you know, how can I explore this data set? Um, there's also other examples on this page or, or elsewhere of prototypes. But finally, it was, it's also a way to communicate. So this was something I did very recently in response to a, a question on the, the D3 mailing list someone had, where they said, oh, I want to visualize the, the distance between nodes in a force-directed graph, right? So. If um, I thought myself, you know, I've, I've thought about this kind of thing before. I like matrices. I studied applied math in, in school. And, and I thought maybe we could visualize it as, as a matrix. So if you watch this orange dot here is represented as this row or this column, the close, if something is close, it's light blue. And if something is far, it's purple. And I just thought, OK, if, you know, if I pull this, this orange dot away, you can see everything in the orange columns over here are purple because it's far away from everything except for itself, right? So in the middle is the diagonal where everything is the same. Um, but if you watch this uh, orange thing and maybe the light green one here, those, those will be the closest even after um, I pull them away. But anyway, I thought about answering this mailing list question with description of this in, in words, but it, it actually was much more effective to write 100 lines of code to, to try this idea out and send the link across. Uh, so I've used you know, this approach a lot in trying to communicate uh, data much more, I guess, efficiently than if I were to try to use words or even uh, sketches. So lately, did I have something else here to show you? Oh yeah, so this is uh, 
tributary visualization of tributaries usage over time, kind of called metaviz, um, and is still collecting. So people are, you know, still using this here and there to, to prototype, and uh, people are still signing up with GitHub. So it's kind of fun. But lately, I've been using this tool called DerbyJS at work. It's a new web framework. You can think of it similar, so similar in functionality to Meteor JS. Uh, but it, it's got a few advantages, I think, in that it's it's all built on node modules. So you can use any piece of it that you want. You can use the the real time backend stuff. You can use the front end part only, which is kind of similar to React or Angular. Um, you can use them all together. You can use your own node modules. You can use this in your own projects or any part of it. Uh, the other ma major advantage is that it's backed by something called OT, or Operational Transform, which is the same algorithm that powers Google Docs to give you the real-time collaboration in, in Google Docs. And it also powered Google Wave when that was a thing. But we actually can do that on any JSON object. So you can do real-time collaboration on any data, essentially, using this framework. And I have a, a small demo that, that uses D3 and Derby, so if, if anybody on their phone or laptop wants to go to charts.derbyjs.com, you can play along with me. We're just, uh, you know, manipulating this data. I'll wait for a few seconds. Um, what I'm actually showing here, uh, and this is actually directly in response to some meetups we've had with the D3 group where people try to, to mix D3 with one of these other frameworks, right? And it's always cha challenging with Angular or, or React. There's kind of these um, patterns that, that the community has found. So this is demonstrating three ways you can use Derby with, um, oh wow, yeah, everyone's playing now. Derby with D3. The first one is just rendering a bar chart in SVG. Um, hey, who's doing that, huh? <laughs> It, it, with just with no D3, so to show that you can, right? You, uh, in any of these frameworks, you should be able to make DOM elements um, from data. Derby is a particularly data-driven framework, um, but you can also use D3. Like, you know, I made a, a component where D3 calculates the layout. So uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the concepts of layouts in D3, but you know, D3 is kind of a toolkit. It has all kinds of tools for different purposes. Um, some like scaling. Scaling your data to you know get a, a pixel value, uh, some things like time and axes and these components that, that give you UI, but layouts are a way of kind of transforming a data set into a, another data set that just happens to be more friendly to, to render. So like pie layouts are like that, tree, ma tree map layouts are like that. They're not actually charts; they're just data transformations. And then finally, you can also just seed control to D3. Um, and not let, let Derby like hands off, just let D3 do it. And so you see that actually there's transitions going on in this one, um, which turn out to not be the best thing always in real time, because you know these are, are interacting immediately as I change the values here, whereas the transitions kind of give you some screwy interactions. So that's just like a, a brief intro to Derby, and, and that's what we're using at, at Lever to build our application and, and a lot of the functionality. So two years ago, I joined Lever full-time to, you know, to work on, on the data side of things. Uh, you know, being a small startup, you, you end up wearing a lot of hats, and you know, I've, I've written application code, I've written, I've spun up servers, had to do what I had to do. But the whole time, thinking about you know, how can we uh, collect the right data so that we can give insights to our customers. How can, you know, how can I apply all these data-driven philosophies I've learned? Playing with D3, you know, how can I create the right data sets that I wish I had when I, every time I download an Excel spreadsheet from some open data website, if I'm lucky, right? It's not a PDF, which we've dealt with. Or, um, you know, I, here's my chance to create a laboratory that, you know, to get the data that I want to get so I can visualize it the way I want to visualize. Um, and you know, put into practice all the things that, that uh, you know, I think are important. And it was about a year ago that I sold my car and, and finally accepted that I was driven by the data. Oh. So uh, real quick, uh, I just want to spend like, you know, not, not too much time just saying what, what Lever is. It's, uh, 
software that companies use to manage their hiring process. So if you're applying to a job at somewhere like Reddit or GitHub, you know, you go here, you read, oh, I want to work there, you apply to the job, you know, upload your resume, do all that stuff. Then on their side, they see something like this. And this is like a demo account uh, with kind of fake data. But you know, they're, they're going to keep track of all the people that applied. Maybe they have people that they found at a meetup like this that you know, they enter the information. They email, you know, email back and forth to, to try to get you to interview. Or you know, maybe you're in the process of interviewing. So you, know, you can keep track of all the people that are interviewing. You have uh, people at the company entering feedback about, about these candidates. And then, you know, as a team, the company makes a decision about hiring this person or, uh, you know, maybe deciding they don't want to hire them. And we call that un archiving to, to kind of go for this inbox zero type uh, thing where you, you get rid of, you know, all the, the people here that you, you no longer want to talk to and, and you can focus your energy on, on talking to these people. So all of that, you know, is it's... It's a tool. What we're building is a tool for a bunch of people inside a company to to do different workflows, um, to you know have build a process to to hire people and and you know figure out who they should hire and, and how to do it. So you might imagine that at many different companies, people have different processes. They have different things they find important. They have different criteria. Um, you know, everyone at the end of the day does want to hire people so that, you know, people like us can do some work and, and you know, feel proud of ourselves and, and make a difference at, at one of these companies. But, you know, the way that I'm sure everyone here has experienced a different interview process, uh, you've experienced uh, different um, software that you've dealt with as, as you're applying. Um, so in order to accommodate all those differences, uh, we made our app actually entirely data driven. So if, if you have an, a company an account that has no data in it, it looks like this. Uh, this is in sharp contrast to something like this, right? Basically can't do anything. There's nothing to see. There's just a couple of zeros and, and empty space. Um, so really, in order to use the app, you need data. And the, the first kind of data you might have is, you know, let's say, what people call a pipeline or, or like stages in your process. I think most of us are probably familiar with maybe like Google Analytics style pipelines or funnels where you, know, you have people come to a website and then they, they convert to another page and then they, they go to another page and finally they, they sign up or they buy something, right? It's kind of the same thing. You, you have people come into your, your pipeline, you, you're trying to hire them, but you have to evaluate them at different phases. And at the end of the day, you hire them or you say, you know, sorry, um, you know, try, try again later. And so the first piece of data you might have describes your, your pipeline, right? So this is all built in, like I said, Derby is, is Node. We have Mongo on the back end. So everything's JSON. And this is an example of, of you know, our, our new applicant stage. So everybody who applies would go in here. But, you know, this data is unique for every account, right? So even though every account actually has a new applicant stage, um, they'll have a unique ID and you know every every account can can customize this but the reason this is important is because you know we're gonna try to to do some visualization we're gonna try to analyze uh, people's data for them but the data is actually different everywhere so we'll get into that uh, shortly you know another place we saw the the job sites of, of reddit or github but if you don't have any job set up you know, you just get an empty page. There's no data to drive this. So you need to set up uh, what we call a job posting. And you describe what you want from people. And, and you know, then it shows up. A job posting JSON looks something like this. Um, it's just, you know, a bunch of metadata, who made it, what account it belongs to. You know, we have certain, yeah, metadata around it. The description's all in here. Uh, so everything that, that shows up here uh, sorry, here is actually stored in a JSON object that looks, you know, pretty much exactly like this. So here would be, you know, an example of that. So 
let, let's take a trip as, you know, as a candidate applying to uh, the Oakland Food Pantry um, near my house in, in West Oakland. And we, we want to volunteer. So let's say I apply. Inside their account, you would see, you know, my, my name would show up. There's one new applicant in here. Um, the app renders like all like a summary of information that I've given, right? Including stuff from my resume, but also things about where I am in the process. That that summary is all driven by one JSON document again. Uh, so we have here, um, you know, simple things like when it happened, um, what stage I'm currently in the process. Is, these are all IDs that you can look up somewhere else, right? Uh, maybe some tags that are associated with my profile. So here we show stuff that, you know, we can help people organize things like I'm a volunteer, West Oakland, uh, things like that. Of course, then the data, like your, the links that you submitted, your application, uh, like your work history, your school history would also be in here. But, you know, one, one important thing to note is that this, this is kind of the representation of your current state in the system. And, and this will be in contrast to historical state, which is actually usually, I think, what interests us as you know, data analysts, engineers, or visualizers. Um, we're, we're generally tending to look for patterns, and a lot of the interesting patterns happen in time. Uh, so it's not enough to just have the current state of somebody, because when we do something in the application, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, in, in Lever, when a user of the system performs an action, right? Like, let's say I say, oh, you know, Ian looks great on paper. Let's, let's call him on, on the phone and, and, you know, do a phone screen, see what he's like. You know, maybe we can evaluate a little more, see if we want to bring him on site to, to talk to him in person. So you move someone into the phone screen stage. We record that as what we're calling a, a story. And you know this is is not really something new. All kinds. Of, I don't know if you looked at GitHub's open data. They have these events. Uh, but basically, a story in, in our system is the who, what, when, and where, right? So here we have um, who did it. There's a, a user ID somewhere in here. Uh, the user here. There's you know what it is. So it's a the action and the the category. Let's say describe what action it was. Uh, when it happened, there's a date timestamp here, and where it happened um, generally is uh, maybe this agent. It's kind of a bad example, but you know, we, there's there's this app that can do things, but you can also email and stuff, or use you know different. There's different ways things can happen in our system, and we want to kind of remember um, where things happen to to be able to categorize that later. Let's say. So, you know, moving along with the process, when you move someone into a phone screen, it will prompt you to schedule a phone screen interview. You know, you do that in the app. This is all kind of like the day-to-day -day life of a recruiter, right? Uh, your job is to, to schedule these things, try to, try to get people hired. Uh, so, so we let you do that. But all the while, you know, when we schedule an interview, there's another JSON object driving it, right? And so everything you need to know about this interview would be here, uh, including the user that scheduled it, what uh, candidate is being scheduled. Even if we're, if we're integrating with Google Calendar, you know, the calendar event would be in here so that we can you know, link it to your Google Calendar. Um, maybe there's some, yeah, a note that goes along with it um, and, and some other stuff to tell the app how to behave when it, when it shows this. So, so we're, you know, we've done, done some actions on, on my profile. Maybe the recruiter goes and does some other stuff while they wait. Uh, maybe somebody else takes over. Um, and we need to be able to show what has happened to me before, right? Um, so th there's a history here in general of, you know, that these are renderings of those JSON objects, actually. So there's... Their divs and, and CSS classes, but uh, you know, not not quite a like fancy SVG stuff right now. But in this case, you know, we can see the history. We can see these JSON uh, objects being rendered, and, and other people can then 
you know, take action on that or, or know what's been happening. But this is just for one, one person right now, right? So again, continuing in the story, I just want to go through the, uh, you know, what might happen as it, when I evaluate Ian and I talk to him and, you know, find out, like, you know, I don't think this guy can handle it. Uh, so I'm going to rate him low and say, like, let's, let's not move forward with this guy. Submit the feedback as the evaluator. And then over in, in the app, I, the, you know, the summary of the, the candidate again, I see that feedback was left and um, we shouldn't move forward with this guy, right? This feedback is, you know, sounding like a broken record, another JSON object. In this case, we have something we call like a, a card where it kind of, we have all kinds of different ways you might have semi-structured data in our app where you have the you know, scores, but you might have multiple choice questions, you might have long form te text. So, you know, this is pretty standard probably for a lot of um, applications that deal with, you know, form-based communication. So we, we have a JSON, you know, a pattern for making JSON objects that that we can store like this and then also render, you know, render back here like this is a rendering of a summary of, of one of these cards. Um, yeah, so, so again, someone comes along, decides, okay, you know, there's bad feedback, we shouldn't waste any more time, let's archive this person, uh, similar to Gmail archive, right, get them out of the list. We'll move them as underqualified. Um, there's, there's a separate list where you can see all the archive people, their profile looks a little bit different, right? Again, the, these classes, the, the way the styling has changed, just looking at the JSON. Um, and then we have another uh, story, this time the, uh, the archiving story, right? Who, who, what, when, and where. So now we've gone through like a typical life of a, an applicant, applicant in, in a lever system. We've got a bunch of metadata in the account that kind of helps us describe what's going on. And we've got a bunch of data that's been generated by users of the account of the system uh, that kind of catalogs what happened. Um, and with all of that, you know, now we can start to think about, okay, we have some history, you know, we, we have all this data around some person, you know, what, what can we start to look for? How, how might we find out patterns across, across our account? Like, is our process, you know, rejecting too many people that shouldn't? Do we have false positives, false negatives? Are we, you know, being too slow? Are we losing out um, candidates based, you know, to other competitors because we're not doing this better or not doing that, you know, on time? Uh, are people falling through the cracks, that kind of stuff. So this is a screenshot, you know, forgive the, uh, the lack of styling. It's an internal tool that I built to pull together all this data around somebody and allow me to kind of, for any given candidate, um, see, see their timeline. Uh, so like the color of each of these bars is, you know, the time they spent in, in a different stage, like, you know, each color would be for a different stage. Uh, the X would be them being archived. Um, I can click on any of these things here and I, I can show a um, quick demo. Like I might want to inspect the JSON of, of one of these stories. Like this is the, or this is the, the, the JSON describing the application itself. Here's the stage change story I showed you before where the, the interview feedback. And you know, a lot of times tools like these help you just quickly um, debug if you know someone is seeing you know seeing some weird behavior and you want to see since everything's driven by the data you, you want to see the data and and see if you have a problem there or if it's a problem in your logic that's, that's um, you know causing this so everything around surrounding this profile will be here and then the thing that we do is actually we we join all this together in a way that allows us to, to have one one JSON object that has all the, the relevant data I need. And I can strip away all the, the extra stuff that I don't care about when I'm, I'm looking at the past. Uh, but I can kind of, you know, bring it all together and, and sculpt the, the perfect JSON object that I, that I want, right? 
um, and that I want to give to my, my colleagues to, to be able to analyze or, or to visualize. So, you know, and this, this interface lets me inspect that, um, that JSON itself. And, you know, for example, taking the stage change stories and creating this timeline is something that goes into this, this JSON. So uh, I don't necessarily want to go into detail here, but here, you know, this timeline is rendered out of this JSON array, which is you know, stored on here. So, you know, I can write this some D3 code that renders out some SVG um, using a time scale, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, the stuff I need and only the stuff I need, you know, the date and some like relevant IDs that I can look up to, to, you know, color things are where I want them. So, you know, it's, it's all well and good to have one, one candidate be able to look, you know, deeper into the data around uh, one thing in your database, kind of understand what you know one person sees, but a lot of times you want to see a lot of things at once, right? And this is where we start trying to find patterns. Uh, you know, this is another prototype of just I just want to see everything in time. I want to kind of get a sense for how you know how long people uh, last relatively. Um, you have weird things like this person's in one stage for a long time and finally someone realized that maybe they, you know, we dropped the ball, we should archive them. See a lot of people very quickly get, drop out and I made, you know, a little smiley face for when someone gets hired. Turns out when people get hired, they generally move really fast too. Um, and you know, we can see, see all that visually and, and it's, it's fun to kind of get a, a intuitive sense for like how a lot of things spread out over time. But what we've been working on a lot lately is, is a little bit less visual, um, but still, you know, a lot of data work. So, we, you know, one thing that almost everyone cares about, just like in, in the Google Analytics stuff, is your conversion, right? Because at the end of the day, you want to know, is your process delivering the results that you want? I think this is kind of universal to most business intelligence or, or business things. So we've developed a, a conversion report and you know you can see numbers that you care about at the top, a uh, summary sentence of, of how you know your, your process is doing in general. And then it, like for now we're just doing these tables. We see each stage in your pipeline and you can quickly understand you know the types of decisions that are being made. So you know, 75% of our phone interviews are moving on to the next stage. Uh, only 25% are, are being archived. So for some company that might be really liberal, right? Like you're, you're advancing a lot of people on and, and every time you bring someone on the onsite, that's time and money you're taking away from, you know, three, four, five of your employees. Um, and, you know, maybe that's not a good thing, but maybe you're actually really prudent and you're sourcing your applications. You don't phone screen somebody unless you, they really look good and it just happens that you're only phone screening good people. So, you know, again, this is sort of different companies have different uh, outcomes and different uh, patterns in their processes, processes, but we're, we're trying to give people a way to, to surface that from these, um, these JSON objects that we've, we've been collecting. Um, and, you know, I think one really interesting thing is that we've learned over the last couple of years of developing these, because these reports haven't always looked like this. They only recently did, and you know, shout out to Andreas who did you know a lot of the design here. Um, before we had we had things where we were we were giving people these numbers that they told us they wanted, like we're giving these tables, and we have you know all kinds of them over here, um, and they're like high level things, and they're they're broken down. You can compare like different jobs, how different jobs are doing with each other, or you know, different sources, like where people are coming from. But we didn't let people see, you know, the underlying data. And, and that, back then it was a little more due to technical constraints why we didn't do that. Oh, no. Is it, uh, let's see. Has this been like that for a while? Oh, shit. Uh, Man. Oh, 
about to cycle through the input page. It's not that long. Is the projector itself just like uh All right, well, thank you for using your imagination that whole time. <laughs> Man, all right. Um, so we left off at, thank God for video editors. Um, man, so we left off here about, and I was talking about like multiple things. Did you guys not see anything about multiple stuff? Such dramatic effect I had planned in there and everything. All right, so, you know, like I was saying, right, you have one, you know, one timeline, uh, one, one candidate playing around with prototyping. Oh, man, those colors are not, okay. Um, it's way better than it was, though. Yes, yes, you can, <laughs> you can see. Like, every, you know, and that's what we aim for, right, as data visualizers, letting people see the data. Um, yeah, so here we have a bunch of, uh, bunch of timelines at once, you kind of get a sense of intuitive sense, like I was saying, and, and so far I've only used this internally to, to kind of do sanity checking and allow myself to, to kind of see some patterns, still thinking about how we can surface this in, an, in a clear way to, to our customers, but uh, you know, obviously this smiley face is very professional, but this is a higher, um, and here you have like someone who, who lasted too long and, and we forgot about, apparently, and uh, all these people we figured out very quickly that we needed to ar archive them. Is that for one specific job? Uh, this could be. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this would be a bunch of people, and, and the idea would be that you would filter them, what you see by the job or by other things. Um, and then, yeah, I was going about this slide for a second, so let me show kind of more a live demo of that same thing. Um, this is the screenshot I took, basically. but. So you have the conversion rates. I was telling you about conversion, the, uh, the analytics you'd want to do, uh, or just like Google Analytics, right? You want to understand your process. You can see how the decisions you've made at every stage, like how they turn out. Um, but you can do things, like we do allow you to filter. So let me filter by, I don't know, backend engineer, create this report. And uh, now I would see that for this. And then down here, as I was trying to get to earlier, how important it is to show the underlying data um, to, your, to the people that you're you know, trying to show this, these aggregations or these summaries to, right? Because if I don't trust that actually five people advanced from the new lead stage, if I, you know, as a recruiter, actually maybe a better example is the number of people hired. And we've had actually another even uh, more fun example would be uh, offers extended. Sorry, let me just stick with the hired one. Um, I know how many people we hired this week, this month, right? Like that is my bread and butter. Um, if I'm an interviewer, if I'm a hiring manager, if I'm somebody trying to hire people onto my team, I know how many people would join, you know, we're having joined the team this month. Like that number is, you know, in my heart, it is not, um, you know, just a statistic. So if I show you the wrong number here, you know, there better be a damn good reason. Um, and I should be able to click down and, and look at, you know, that the people being counted that added up to that number, right? Um, and then if, if there's something weird here, then maybe it makes sense like, oh yeah, we accidentally hired that person, but then, or clicked hired in the app, but then we, un you know, didn't undo it or something. Um, you know, and that's, that's already happened to us a few times where we could say, okay, let's like drill down and, and find out what actually happened. Um, and then this is, you know, this is showing just another a list of people, but we could also show those, those timeline visualizations here. Like this, the data that drives this table is actually all in that JSON blob that I, I showed earlier. So we could render it here uh, if we, you know, when we get to get around to designing how that that might be intuitive, uh, but for now we even just show it as like a list of, of uh, events that happen with dates. 
So, you know, all very simple, but um, to me, this is really kind of the first step of allowing people to see their data in a way, you know, a level above a spreadsheet or like a level above the database. Um, we are providing some useful aggregations and summaries for them based on what, you know, we've heard people want to see. But really, you know, by, by allowing this filtering, by, you know, being able to see all the people that went through the offer stage and the back end engineer report, you know, you can get down to list you want. And I think the next step is, is visualizing these, these numbers that people care about over time, um, you know, comparing them, you know, job against job, if that's what's interesting to you, or uh, recruiter against recruiter, interviewer against interviewer, that kind of thing. Um, but I also wanted to, to talk about another thing that was a little bit less expected or planned uh, that came out of, of being able to do this, which is dealing with, with problems in our workflow. So problems in our data collection. Um, I don't know how many of you here work at, at startups or, or are, are building software as fast as you can, but you can't always uh, build out everything exactly, you know, like you can't, you don't have time to find the perfect process. You have to get to 80% and, you know, give people 80% of what they need so they can keep doing their jobs and then you'll know, learn what is you know the, the rest of the 20% should be and and you need to like um, you know build incrementally and you know move fast right so what what can happen is that your the data like you know everything is being is data driven right we're generating all this data sometimes that data isn't enough or sometimes that data is not quite um, correct or you know People, we've built this flexible system where people can kind of develop their own process, but they can't, or they end up doing things that, you know, we didn't expect because we're like, well, you know, why would any rational person do that? But anyone who's developed software, especially for consumers, knows that people will click every button and they will do everything that you let them do. Um, so, you know, here is a, I think one nice example of what happened, happened to us is that in our system, we actually allow you to, to apply for multiple jobs. And you know, every system allows you to apply for multiple jobs, but the crazy thing about our system is that one person applying for multiple jobs shows up one time in the database. And every other system, this isn't true. If you apply to two jobs, you'll be in two places. And you know, somebody leaving notes about you in the account executive role will not see notes left about you in the customer success manager role. Um, so we, we're building this sort of candidate-centric is the, the buzzword we're using, but you know, there's there's one one item for you as a person. Uh, we we believe you know, people get hired, not jobs don't get filled, right? But this you know this nice uh, ideal leaves us with a case where you know this guy's great. Uh, this is actually our customer success team um, up here, and they're all awesome people. And and when we hired Josh, he had two jobs open, um, and he was considered hired for both in our system. Right, and really, we only hired him for customer success. Uh, he was, you know, great fit for that, and that's the, you know, the job for him. Um, but now there's this other record of him being hired for account executive, and you know, actually, the right, the correct number is shown here. There's three hires, but there was a time where like we didn't even see that, and you know, we fixed that. But still, it's it's weird. If you were to filter by the account executive job, he would show up there too as hired. And that could bias your reports if you're trying to watch the account executive role, right? You're a VP of sales and you want to know how many people have we hired for account executive and he shows up. That's not right. So by seeing the data and understanding like this workflow happening, we're able to go back in and adjust the software so that when you're actually doing your job, you can't do this, this thing. Like we, we say, okay, you now you have to choose what job you got hired for and then choose some other archive reason uh, for these other things, right? And so it's actually become um, a way to have this feedback loop between you know, the data, the reporting, and uh, the workflow. And so how many people here are Full Metal Alchemist fans and might recognize this? No? All right, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, just kind of a, 
a little summary of, of the way that, that I've been thinking about uh, reporting or, or data, data analysis and, and the role that data visualization should play in developing software like this. Um, you know, it, at the center of everything, we have the data driving the process. You know, the data um, allows us to measure everything. But you know, the, by be exposing it, by seeing it, we can get insights that we give to our customers, right? Um, in the form of these reporting functionalities, we also have insights that we you know give to ourselves so that we can can drive the workflow. And you know. None of this is really scientific, so that's, you know, I'm calling it data alchemy because, you know, at the end of the day, my job is to turn all this data through these, these processes into gold. And that's all I have.